So in today's video, I will discuss what SIBO infections are, what causes them, the prevalence of SIBO cases, the type of bacteria commonly found in SIBO infections, and I finally will cover off the basics of testing and how you generally fix the problem. Hey everyone, welcome back to the SIBO Hub. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Simon Hammett and I'm a qualified nutritionist. I had and cleared SIBO very quickly around seven years ago. And over the last 24 months, I have helped over 2000 people test and resolve their SIBO infections. And as soon as we're out of lockdown, I will be starting a PhD in SIBO. So it's an area that I'm extremely passionate about. So let's jump in to the video. So within the small intestines, bacterial activity very rarely exceeds a thousand organisms per milliliter. And these bacteria are usually unable to make their way into the small intestines and thrive due to gut motility and also your stomach acid. And when failings occur in the production of stomach acid or when gut motility is impacted, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth can occur. So quite simply, SIBO is a condition where there is an abnormal accumulation of bacteria within your small intestines. Now, as I've just said, SIBO can occur when there are issues with stomach acidity levels or when your gut motility is impacted. But these are just two of the very common facilitators of SIBO infections. Other common causes of SIBO include chronic pancreatic insufficiency, which just means that you don't have sufficient digestive enzymes to break down your food correctly. And then we have ileocecal valve problems. So the ileocecal valve is just a muscle that separates the large and small intestines. And when there is dysfunction in this valve, it can allow the migration of bacteria from the large intestines into the small intestines. So in the large intestines, you have a lot of bacteria as this is where the majority of your microbiome resides. And then the small intestines, as I've already said, you are not supposed to have too much bacteria. Next up on the common causes of SIBO, we have gut abnormalities and also diseases. So if you have conditions such as small intestinal diverticulosis, bowel strictures and other physiological defects in the gut, then it can leave you more susceptible for developing SIBO. The final area that I want to cover off is immunoglobulins. So as part of your immune system, you have antibodies that play a crucial role in protecting you against bacteria and viruses. Anyway, your body produces secretions such as your eyes, nose, throat, mouth and gut. These immunoglobulins are in the secretory form. So in the gut, the immunoglobulins are called secretory IgA. So secretions think secretory. Now, if you have some sort of immune disease or you are taking medications that suppress your immune function, then you may be more susceptible to SIBO as your immune system is not able to efficiently clear out the bacteria from your small intestines. So just to summarize, stomach acidity, pancreatic enzyme insufficiency, gut motility problems, ileocecal valve issues, and also secretory IgA problems can allow SIBO to manifest. And obviously all of these areas can severely be impacted by poor diet, excessive alcohol consumption, antibiotic use and other medications, and also things like stress. So with the common causes out of the way, let's delve into the epidemiology and prevalence of the disease, and also the pathophysiology of the disease or the type of bacteria that's usually involved. This is important because once you know what the common drivers are and what type of bacteria are involved, it makes it a lot easier to fix the problem. So in terms of the prevalence of SIBO, this is largely unknown. Although from the best available evidence we have to date, it is estimated that anywhere from 60 to 84% of those with IBS have SIBO as the driving factor. So the global prevalence of IBS is around 11.2%. So in the UK, for example, it's slightly above this, and we have an IBS prevalence of around 17%. So in the UK, that means that currently there are potentially up to 11 million people suffering with IBS as a result of SIBO. So if they fix their SIBO infection, then their IBS symptoms are likely to significantly improve or fully resolve. But we will get to this shortly. So now we know the causes and prevalence, let's move on to the bacteria themselves that are driving SIBO infections. And the most common bacteria involved are Streptococcus, Lactobacillus and also Bacteroides. Now many people assume that SIBO was formed from bad bacteria, but Streptococcus, Lactobacillus and Bacteroides are part of a normal healthy microbiome and these bacteria play a pivotal role in your gut health. So take out of your mind good and bad, often the bacteria involved in SIBO infections are actually very good. They are just migrating to a part of the gut that they shouldn't be. 
Next, with all of this out of the way, let's discuss some of the common symptoms associated with SIBO infections. The most common ones include bloating, flatulence, chronic watery diarrhea or constipation, depending on the type of SIBO that you have, fat malabsorption and weight loss are also common occurrences. Other common issues with SIBO infections are nutritional deficiencies of things like vitamin B12 and iron because of iliomucosal damage. All this simply means that the bacteria that have found their way into your small intestines can burrow into the intestinal wall lining and create damage, which can cause intestinal permeability and also leaky gut. Other very common issues in people with SIBO infections are heartburn, food sensitivities and intolerances, anxiety and depression, skin issues such as rosacea, psoriasis or eczema, and in some people, even joint problems. For those with significant SIBO infections, where the person has developed substantial intestinal permeability or leaky gut, then the person may start to run into autoimmune conditions such as thyroid disease. So we know what causes it and we broadly know what the prevalence is. And if you think you may have it, what is the best way of testing for the condition? And here, quite simply, the gold standard for testing SIBO is biopsy and culture of intestinal aspirates. However, because of the risks associated with these type of procedures and the high costs, it is not practical to test everyone in this manner, so the small intestinal breath test was developed. This means that it's cheap and sufficiently accurate to test people using simple breath tests. So a breath test simply involves drinking a solution and then you measure the amount of gas produced by the bacteria in the small intestine and then if it crosses a certain threshold you are diagnosed with SIBO. Now there are two common breath tests that are performed, one of which should not be used as it has a number of big limitations. So the two tests used are the glucose and also lactulose breath tests. Many doctors still recommend the glucose breath test and this is unfortunate for the people being tested in this way. So glucose is absorbed higher up in the small intestines. So if your infection is lower down in the small intestines, which is very common, then the glucose won't get down to that bacteria and you may get a false negative test result. So the other breath test used and the best that we have available is the lactulose breath test. So humans don't have the ability to digest lactulose as it's a synthetic sugar. So if you have a SIBO infection, the lactulose solution will go through the stomach and into the small intestines where it will be heavily fermented by the gut bacteria and then this produces a lot of gas that is then measured by the breath test. If there is no bacteria present, then the lactulose solution will go through the stomach, through the small intestines, through the colon and then out through the bowels. Now I will cover off testing in much more detail in future videos, but if this is your first exposure to SIBO, then you just need to remember that if you are being tested for SIBO, that you want to use a lactulose breath test that covers both hydrogen and methane, and the test needs to be three hours in length. If someone is only trying to measure your hydrogen levels, or they're trying to use only a glucose solution, or they're trying to run the test over two hours instead of three hours, then don't do the test as this format could potentially give you many false positives or negatives. The last area that I want to cover off in this video is how you treat SIBO infections. Now this is very much dependent on the type of SIBO infection that you have, what the drivers of your SIBO infection are, your diet and also the state of your overall health. To combat SIBO infections, we generally have the following at our disposal. So antibiotics such as rifaximin and neomycin, natural antibiotics such as Alimed and Berberine. You can also use elemental formulas to get rid of SIBO infections, and this essentially means drinking only a nutritional shake until the infection has gone. I will do a dedicated video on elemental formulas, for 99% of people, I recommend they avoid these as relapse rates of SIBO infections tend to be a little bit higher and it's really not much fun for a person drinking liquids for three to six weeks. The other area that you obviously need to consider with SIBO infections is your diet. Now you will hear all sorts of things online about diets and low carbohydrate diets are better than high carbohydrate diets. I will cover all of this off in very detailed videos in the future but you just simply need to understand that you can fix SIBO infections with both high and low carb diets. Over the last 24 months, I have helped thousands of people test and resolve their SIBO infections using both high and low carbohydrate diets. So don't be fooled into thinking that only low carb diets will work. If you fix the underlying issues that allow the infection to manifest in the first place, then you can resolve SIBO infections using almost any type of diet. So that's the end of today's video. Let me know in the comments below what you would like the next video to be about. And until then, 
I'll see you next time.